this morning, we've been talking about all these different elements of crazy faith. We've talked about what it looks like to be able to really forgive people in a really radical way. We've talked about how to live out all the things that God is asking us to, how to be evangelistic, how to be loving, how to actually be able to show people who Jesus is. And today, we're talking about a word that I feel like most parents, you got a love-hate relationship with this word. Any guesses? No. <laughs> obedience. Obedience. We're talking about obedience. And, uh, you know, most people, or, you know, in my case, dog owners, you value obedience. You value obedience. If you tell your child, please do not run into the street, you would hope that they are going to listen to you. Same with my dog. He has very poor obedience skills. We have tried so hard over the years, and at this point, we've just accepted that there's no hope for him, and he's really cute, and so that's about as good as it's going to get. And I shared this story Wednesday. You know, I'm a pretty laid-back person. When I've been dealing with the students for the last nine years, there is one moment where I've ever yelled at someone, like outright yelled. One moment. Most of the time, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty gracious. But we had this one moment. We run a fireworks tent, if you haven't picked up on that yet. We run a fireworks tent because we're crazy, and we like to give all the money away to missions. And so we've run this tent for more than 20 years. And my first year that I was in charge of the tent, we had a student who I will call Billy. That is not his real name. And Billy just really liked to do wild things. He, he was very athletic. He could do all these like back handsprings and all this different stuff. And, and one day I had walked outside the tent and Billy had climbed up on top of the semi-trailer that we had outside. So I'm in mean, pretty high. And we had our dumpster next to that semi-trailer. And I walk out and I'm just kind of like looking at him. You know, you ever, maybe you've done this with your kids and you like see them and you're going, what are you going to do? And so I, I walk outside and I start walking toward him and he turns around backwards and I realize he's going to try to do a backflip off the semi into the dumpster. Pretty scary moment. And so I yelled at him to not do that. And then I was called mean and all these different things. But for me in that moment, just like maybe for you as a parent, when you realize that someone is about to hurt themselves, you might do something a little out of the ordinary in order to get their attention to keep them from getting hurt. Or maybe in other moments, you just want what's best for them. You want what's best for them. They're not about to do something dangerous, but you give them instructions, you give them feedbacks. And in this moment, I was hoping that that student was either scared enough of me yelling, because I never yell, or that he trusted me enough to not do what he was about to do, and thankfully he didn't. You know, and many of times for us, our ability to obey is based around three different questions. And I'm sure there's more than this, but these are the three that came to my mind. Number one, am I willing to listen? Am I willing to listen? And for most children, most of the time, right, that's their problem. They just don't want to listen. They don't want to listen. It's not about you. They just don't want to. Number two, do I trust you? Do I trust what you are telling me to be true? Number three, do I respect your authority? Maybe you've ever, in a work situation, you've had someone who is like so far beneath you on the totem pole at work come to you and give you feedback on your job and you go, oh, thank you so much for that. I do not trust your authority to tell me what to do. But you know, in all these different moments, it can be hard for us to receive feedback and to want to be obedient to what is being asked. Maybe someone comes to me and they're giving me feedback and I've just had a really bad day. I didn't sleep the night before, I didn't eat well, they didn't get my coffee order right at Starbucks, and I just cannot receive what they're trying to tell me. Maybe this person is just like not credible, and so I can't listen to them. Maybe they're not someone I respect, so I easily tune them out. And there's probably a lot of other reasons why we don't want to obey what is being told of us. But what about for us as followers of Jesus? When we look at our relationship with God specifically, why do we struggle to obey him? Why do we struggle? Because I think if we're all honest, there's different moments where we struggle to be obedient to what God is asking. And I think ultimately it comes down to those same three questions, just posed in a different way. Number one, am I even listening for God's voice? Am I taking the time to slow down and to hear him? Am I reading the word? Am I listening to worship music? Am I surrounding my life 
with different circumstances so I am able to hear him. Number two, do I trust what God is telling me to do? I know we've talked about this a little bit over the last year. Like sometimes it feels really hard to trust what God is asking us to do because maybe things just aren't going the way that you thought they should be going. Number three, do I respect God's authority to direct my life? And that's a hard question because I think we'd all like to easily be like, yes, he's God. Of course, I respect his authority to direct my life. But how many times has God asked you to do something and you've just thought, are you sure about that? Are you sure about that, God? I don't know about that because I can't see the outcome. And so today we're going to throw it back to the Old Testament and we're going to look at Noah. We're going to look at the story of Noah. And I know it's a story that maybe you've grown up hearing, you've grown up, I can picture in Sunday school as a kid, the little, what were they called, the felt boards, and they'd like put the little pictures on the boards. I don't know what it was called, but they were cool. And, but, you know, the story of Noah. But as we read it, I want you to think about some of these elements of this story in a little bit of a different way. Think about it in a different way. So we pick up in the story of Noah, and we're in Genesis chapter 6. Everything has kind of just happened, right? Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And the world has already at this point become so evil that God decides he's going to just wipe it out. And if you're curious about some of this and you're like, wow, how could God do that? You are wanting to dig into that a little bit more. There is this incredible app called the Bible Project. They just launched a new app. We've used a lot of their stuff in the past. But they have a whole podcast, hour-long episode on the flood. And it's incredible to listen to. So if you're curious about some of these other deeper conversations about the story of Noah, definitely check that out this week. It's thebibleproject.com, and they have all this, all this. They've got videos. It's really cool. But there was only one righteous person on the whole face of the earth. And like, let that sink in. One. One righteous family out of everyone who existed on the earth. And that was Noah, his wife, and their three sons. And so God comes to Noah in Genesis chapter 6, and he tells him, he's like, look, I've decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. And we know that was not God's original intention, that he created everything to be good, to be perfect, that things would live in peace. But sin, because of Adam and Eve, it brought all this destruction and violence into the world. And so God says, I'm going to wipe everything out. What you have to do is to build a large boat from cypress wood, waterproof it with tar inside and out, then construct decks and stalls throughout its interiors, make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side, build three decks inside. Look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood and destroy everything that breathes. Everything will die but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, and you and your wife and your sons and their wives bring a pair of every kind of animal, every kind of bird, every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. And this is the verse that sticks out to me. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. So let's unpack this for a moment. God comes directly to Noah. He doesn't send an angel. He comes directly to him and speaks to him. He tells him he's going to flood the earth and destroy everything. Now, Noah has never seen a flood, as far as we know, and not a flood of that kind of magnitude. For all we know, he might have never even seen a boat. I mean, we don't know if they had boats. He could have had no idea what this looked like, and they definitely would never have built anything this big. The ark would have been about half the size of the Titanic. Um, if you look up kind of images of what that would have looked like, half the size of the Titanic. It was huge, big enough to be able to house all these different creatures. Then God tells him he needs two of every animal to be on the boat and enough family, enough food for his family and all these creatures to eat. And the next verse just says, and Noah did everything that God told him to do. And if that was me, if I was Noah, I would have had a million questions I would have had a million questions like, yeah, God was really specific and he gave me the dimensions for the boat. How am I supposed to build this boat? Did he even have the DIY skills to be able to build this boat? We don't know. We don't know. There wasn't YouTube. There was not Chip and Joanna Gaines to be able to help him to build his shiplap boat. Like Noah is being told to do things that most likely he had never, ever done. 
or maybe never even seen before. And now Noah maybe did ask God questions and they just weren't recorded in this chapter. And the most important part of what is happening here is verse 22, that Noah did everything that God asked him to do. Because Noah was the only righteous person on the face of the earth, we can assume he had a relationship with God, that he trusted him, that he respected him, that he was willing to listen to him, even if he did not fully understand what was happening. And this is our definition of crazy faith for this week. Crazy faith is the ability to obey everything that God is telling you to do, even though you can't see the outcome even though you can't see the outcome, the ability to just obey, even when you don't know what's going to happen or how you're going to do it or what all the little millions of details are that you obey. And the ark would have taken years to build. This was not like, you know, a seven-week project. It would have taken years. And unfortunately, Noah didn't have, like, power tools. Like, think think about this. I'm, like, getting anxiety thinking about Noah his three sons and his wife trying to figure out how to build this boat. For me, the biggest home project I think we ever took on was uh, we refinished some floors in our last house, and we had to patch part of the floors. And I'm thankful for my dad, who's watching online today, who came over because he had the knowledge to be able to do that. He showed us what to do. He had done that before. And so it wasn't like as stressful as it would have been if we had no idea what we were doing. But this is the situation that Noah's in. He is taking on a massive project with no knowledge on how to do it, but he obeys every anyway. And year after year, he just kept building. Year after year, he just kept building. One piece at a time, he made the ark exactly how God commanded him to. God did not need Noah to like rush to get this done right? Like he was not like, you have to get this done in seven weeks. This is the deadline. God just needed him to be faithful to finish, to be faithful to keep working, to be faithful to keep going. So often in our lives, I think we feel like this rush and this pressure to get our whole lives together immediately. And we've got to be doing like every single thing and all this different stuff. And it becomes very overwhelming. Just like if maybe you've taken on, uh, you know, when we renovated this building, we bought this building, I think in my mind, I thought we could get everything done within a year. That felt, yeah, as everyone laughs, that felt very reasonable. All we needed to do with most of the things was to paint. We knocked out a couple walls out there. It was years, years, because it was overwhelming to just keep having to do that while we all still had our other jobs to do, right? But year after year, we slowly got it done, and now we only have the bathrooms left, and so we're, we're almost there, almost there. But God doesn't need us to feel like we are under this immense timeline pressure. He wants us to prioritize rest. He wants you to find a good pace. He wants you to just keep going and to understand that he doesn't need you to be exhausted in order to be successful. God doesn't need you burnt out. God just needs you to continue to obey what he's asking you to do, that little by little, you would trust him and trust that he is building something beautiful through your life. Year after year, day after day, that we can trust what he's building through us. And this also is not in the story recorded in Genesis, but you have to imagine people like saw what he was doing and people thought he was probably kind of crazy right? Like if you just walked out into your yard and your neighbor is building this titanic sized boat by hand, it's kind of weird. It would be kind of weird. And another good indicator, I think, of crazy faith is when people who are far from God don't understand what you're doing. When they don't understand what you're doing and in a good way, right? Like don't be crazy in a weird way. I know we've talked about this before. We don't need weird, crazy Christians, Be crazy in a good way. You know, one of my favorite conversations that I get to have every year, I have it every year, no matter what, is when we're at the fireworks tent. And people will come in to buy their fireworks, and it comes up every single time. They'll go, you really give all this money away? You don't pay anyone to come out here. And I'm like, believe me, I wish you paid me to come out here every single day. And I'm like, no. We give all of it away because we believe that is what God asked us to do that we want to be generous, that we want to sacrifice that week and work really long hours and be out in the heat and lift boxes and hurt our backs and all this different kind of stuff 
because we believe that it matters that we can give that completely away to missionaries. It's one of my favorite conversations I get to have because no one ever understands it. It's so crazy to them because it is crazy. It is absolutely crazy that that's what we do, but that is what it should look like in all of our lives, that we have these crazy moments of generosity, that how we treat people, that how we spend our money, that how we spend our time is so weird to other people because we are more concerned about others than we are about ourselves. And that's what we want to be doing, is that we would always be more concerned with building God's kingdom than building our own. And so despite having very little help and maybe dealing with a lot of haters, Noah finishes the boat. He finishes the boat, and God comes back to him. And this is what he says. He says, when everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with your family, for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Seven days from now, I will make the rains pour down on the earth, and it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the earth everything I have created. So once again, Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. He was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board with his wife and his sons and their wives with all of the various kinds of animals. They entered the boat in pairs, male and female, just as God commanded them. And after seven days, the waters and the flood came and covered the earth. Noah was 600 years old on the 17th day of the second month, and all the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. And so much of this is really cool to look into deeper. Please go listen to the Bible Project podcast about how all this water came up. It's really fascinating. But the rain continued for 40 days and 40 nights. And here's what we take away from this portion. You are only responsible to do what God has asked you to do. You are only responsible to do your part. Noah didn't need to worry about getting the animals there. He didn't have to go out and round them up or try to trap them or bait them into coming. God sent them and they came. Noah didn't have to need to worry about making it rain. God took care of that because that's what God said he was going to do. Noah just needed to build the ark to get the food for everyone, and to get his family on board. That was it. That was all that he was responsible for to do. And for each of us, I think sometimes we get so concerned with like, how is any of this actually going to happen, that we spend all this time worrying, all this time panicking. And, and I mean, I'm here with you, right? Like I am the queen of overthinking every detail, of worrying about how all this stuff is going to happen. But here's the thing. I only have to be responsible for my part. I have to be responsible for what God has asked me to do. I am not responsible for any of the rest of you. I'm not. I'm not responsible for your actions or for your decisions. I'm only responsible to do the things that God is asking me to do. And all God is asking each of us to do is to obey what he has commanded. To just obey and to trust that he's going to take care of all the other things. And this is exactly what God does for Noah. He makes the animals show up. He makes the rains come. He's the one who shuts them into the ark. And because Noah obeyed and did his part, the ark stayed afloat, right? You had to imagine that was probably a little bit of a nervous moment. Is this thing actually going to float in the water as we're stuck out here for a long time? And they waited on the ark then for over 150 days before the water had finally subsided enough from the earth. And they continued to wait until God came back to them once more. And God comes back to him again in chapter 8, and he says, all right, now you can leave the boat. And I think it's important to note that they waited again for God to speak. Sometimes we are so impatient, and we don't wait for God to come back to us. Wait for God to speak to you. He says, get off the boat. It's good. Release all the animals so they can be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth. So Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives left the boat. And out of all, all the large and small animals and birds came out of the boat pair by pair. Don't rush what God is trying to do. Don't rush it. Don't get impatient. It's hard in the moment, but life is really long. Life is long. Don't rush. Don't feel like if you haven't accomplished what you're trying to accomplish in a week or a month or a year that you're a failure. Wait, listen, and trust that God knows what he's doing. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's where we're pulling a lot of this series from. It's called the faith chapter. And it tells us in verses 1 and 2 that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. 
It's the evidence of things we can't see. Through their faith, the people in days of old gained a good reputation. And then down in verse 7, it talks about all these different people in the Bible and their stories of faith. But in verse 7, that's Noah's verse. It says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah didn't care what anyone else thought of him. He knew God. He had a close relationship with him. He was listening for his voice. He trusted him and he respected his authority enough to be crazy obedient and to be listed in this chapter. And ultimately, crazy faith requires the belief that God will take care of you, that God will take care of you. And maybe that can be hard to believe sometimes because you just feel like, maybe right now you feel like God is not showing up for you in the way you want. Maybe life has felt hard. Maybe you haven't felt that other people care about you. But God will take care of you. He will take care of you. He will take care of every detail, and he will tell you what to do. If we want to follow him and live lives of obedience that will affect generations, Like I think about all these people who are listed in Hebrews chapter 11 and we read their stories still and we're so inspired by them. And I think within this room, and those of you watching online, that you could tell the story of your life and the story of the ways that God has been faithful to you. You You can tell the story of how your obedience paid off in the end, even though in the moment you maybe couldn't understand it. When I think of the story of my life, Think about how at 18, I felt like I was supposed to go to school in Florida, and so I just went. I went, and I went in as a pre-law major, and I was so set that that's what I was going to do, but God spoke to me so clearly, and he was like, no. And so I changed my major, and I started pursuing a degree in practical theology, and I had no idea what I was going to do with that degree. And I really mean that. I don't say that to be humble. I never saw myself becoming a pastor. I I really didn't know what I was going to do with this kind of degree, but I knew I felt a call to ministry. And I went for three and a half years, and I got a degree, and Josh and I, we got married super young, and a lot of people did think we were crazy, and and we're, you know, still married now 10 years later, and I'm thankful, and we moved back to Topeka, and we started planning our roots back here, and we still didn't really know what we were going to be doing, and I was working at Olive Garden, Josh was working in insurance, and we just kept showing up to church, because that was where we loved to be, and we kept serving, and we kept you know, following God and being obedient to him. We started tithing even though it was really hard and we had like no money. We had no money. And little by little, God started revealing what was happening. And he spoke to me and I became a youth pastor. And that's been the craziest, most awesome part of my life for the last nine years. And then we've just kept doing it. And Josh became a pastor too. And we were both really surprised by that because we were, neither of us thought we'd be pastors. And his degree's in film. At least I had a degree in, like, religion. And he became a pastor. And and in all these moments, I wish you could see the the behind-the-scenes of it, that you could see us at our house being like, this is really bizarre. Like, this is not, are you sure about this? I don't know about this. Like, you know, and just hours and hours and hours of going back and forth about, like, is this really what we're supposed to be doing? But at the end of the day, in all these different moments, we knew that God had spoke. And that was the thing that's been different about other moments in our lives. In these moments, we knew that God spoke. We knew what he said, and so we just, like, blindly jumped. We blindly jumped, and and last year we became an independent church, and every day we thought, oh, dear God, are you sure this is still what we are supposed to be doing? And we just kept growing, and we kept going, and we kept being obedient to just build little by little, little by little. And here we are a year later, and we have so much to celebrate from this last year. There's so much good that has happened, even though many moments along the way we just thought, what are we even doing? What are we doing, God? What are you doing? But he does reveal it. And it begins to build this story throughout your life where you can look back and say, wow, there's no way any of that would have happened unless God had spoke, unless it was him really working and moving in the details. And to be honest, you know, I don't know what the ultimate outcome of, like, my life's going to be. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know all the things that I'm going to do. I will never be able to see the impact that we really have on different people. But I do know that if God is in charge of my life, that I can trust him with the outcome. 
If he's in charge of my life, I can trust him with the outcome. I can trust him. And I can continue to just do the small things that he asks me to do. For each of us, we have to learn how to listen for God's voice, to trust what he's telling us to do, and to respect that we would have a holy fear of God, that when he speaks, we would just go, okay. It's like, you know, if if my dad ever used his stern voice and he says, you better stop doing that, I would go, okay, dad. And we have to feel like that at some level with God, that we would not doubt as much what he was saying, and we would just go for it. We would go for it because we respect him. We know that he loves us and that he can see so much more of what's going on than we ever can. Take it step by step and trust that God is going to walk with you every step of the way. And so today as we close, I want to give you just a minute as the team comes, they're just going to kind of play maybe softly, to reflect on some of the questions from earlier. Which one of these questions is hard for you? Maybe for you, you just struggle to feel like you can hear God's voice. You struggle to make time to listen for him. Maybe you have a hard time trusting God because a lot of people in your life have really let you down. Maybe you still yet don't really see God as that ultimate authority of your life, as the one who is in charge of all of it. And today, you're going to gain that healthy, holy fear of him, a respect of who he is. And as we take just a minute to reflect, will you be brave enough to take a step forward in obedience today? Even if you don't know how it will turn out. I think for each of us, there's probably things that God has been laying on our hearts and we've just not been doing them because they're scary, because we just don't want to. For me, that's been most of, of for me, why I've struggled to follow God. I either just, I didn't want to. I didn't want to become a pastor. I didn't want to. Now I, I do love it. But I didn't want that. Dealt with a lot of fear over the years and different moments. Like, am I good enough to be leading some of these things? Am I, am I good enough to be doing what God is asking me to do? Do I have what it takes? And most of the time I don't, but it's God who works through us. It's God who empowers us to do what he's asking us to do. But will you be brave enough to be obedient? Most of the time, God is not going to be asking you to build a giant boat. He's not asking anything like insane of you. But he's asking us to be faithful day by day to do the things that he is telling us to do. And then as he puts new things in front of us, as he lays someone on your heart, maybe who he's wanting you to reach out to, as he asks you to maybe go and serve in a way or to change your job, will you be obedient? Will you choose to keep going? Obedience to God often feels really hard because we want to know how it's all going to work out. We want to know that it's all going to be okay. We want to know that it's not going to be hard, that it's not going to be challenging. But obedience will lead to the most rewarding kind of life because it truly is the kind of life you can look at and be like, wow, that was none of that was me. It was all God. God will take care of you. And all you need to do is to listen, to trust, and obey. So if you would, will you just take a minute to just kind of close your eyes in in your seat. You just get alone with God. Take a minute to reflect. Take a minute to just to listen for his voice. To listen for what he's asking you to do. Maybe today God just wants to reassure you that you are doing everything possible. You are doing everything you possibly can. You're doing a great job. And he sees that sees that and he's with you.
us that you love, that we can trust, that you really will take care of us, even if it feels messy and hard right now. That you are with us. That you will never ask anything of us that is that is unaccomplishable. Because you will help us to do it. opportunities to grow our faith, that you want to give us opportunities to show love and generosity to the people who we meet. God, we thank you that you want to use each of our lives for something really awesome, for something great, for something grand. And maybe it's not going to feel as grand as some of the things that the people in Hebrews chapter 11 did, but each of us, God, you designed us, you created us, Just listen, to trust, and to obey. God, we love you. Would you continue to speak to us throughout the remainder of this service, throughout the rest of today? May we have encounters with you while we're watching the Chiefs game. May we have encounters with you tomorrow when we go to work. Would you continue to show us and help us to be aware of your voice? We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name.